Hey guys, good morning, good afternoon, good night. Cheers. I guess a virtual cheers, right? All right. Hey, before we get started today, here's what I want to say. May, Internal Audit Awareness Month. May is also Mental Health Awareness Month. Our job is pretty tough, right? I, I once had a client tell me, hey, Rob, you know, I, I hate what you do, but I like how you do it. So there is a stigma associated with what we do. And sometimes we have to have thick skin and sometimes we hold things in. Stop holding stuff in. Get some help if you need help. There's a network of people out there that are willing to help you. You can reach out to other auditors. I know Joe Kelly and I get emails and texts and all kinds of stuff from people all the time. But recognizing that May is Internal Audit Awareness Month. It is also Mental Health Awareness Month. Don't let your clients drive you crazy. Okay, so <laughs> that's the end of my serious moment. Hey, <laughs> we are back, you guys. Joe and Kelly are back. Uh, Joe, how was Savannah? It was excellent. I wore my I Love Audit gear, uh, my, my That Audit Guy gear, and I wore it again today. Yes, I washed it in between, uh, but I did wear it in Savannah. For the lovely coastal Georgia IIA chapter, they were fantastic. And can I just say it was great to be out and about in front of people, even though I love this virtual world with you guys. Uh, it was really nice. So, but yep, I'm sporting my dear my gear for the month. Awesome. And and coastal Georgia chapter. Call me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm they're on here. I'll make sure I get them on. <laughs> so Kelly, how are you? I am awesome. I'm excited for this Friday Fraudster, especially because I wore my pink too. And uh, because we're going to highlight some true pink collar criminals today. So, you know me, I'm all excited about the pink. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are. So everybody, you know the deal. As you come into the room, drop that emoji that signifies the mood that you are in right now. And Hal is in a very, very, very silly mood. Devon says it's happy hour. Yeah, it's five o'clock somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Thomas says, happy Friday, everyone. Looking forward to another great LinkedIn live. This is how Thomas is feeling. Thomas is feeling good, too. Heather, it whoa. Heather, are you still at work? <laughs> I, see, I see margaritas and sushi, it looks like. So uh, let's see here. They are a great chapter. Oh, good. They've been to some of you guys' meetings. Yeah, it's not that far. About what? Maybe two hours? Yeah. Pozo says it's great to have the three of us back together. And you guys, if you've never listened to my podcast, The Corporate Quitters, I interviewed Pozo. It was a great interview. She is about to become the most downloaded episode. Right now, Joe actually holds that title. She's going to take over my title? She oh. is about to take over your title. Sherry is happy today. Good. So now, now that we know how everyone is doing, let's get into our stories for today. Boy, Whew. you guys ready for today's stories? Today is going to be, um, wow. Let's just get into it. <clears throat> <laughs> Some of you saw the teaser. She so she she stole three point seven million dollars. But let's talk about the backstory. For forty two years, her boss was a, a a chemist, and he first set up his business on the outskirts of Sydney. He was about to meet with four international businessmen who wanted to buy him out. Now, just fifteen minutes prior to them arriving, his personal assistant Vicky came up to him. And, well, she said those dreaded words that you never, ever, ever want to hear someone say. She said, I need to talk to you. Now, I don't know about you guys, but whenever I hear those words, there's only one thing that comes to my mind. And let's see if this works. Oh, now, Andrew. let me know if you guys heard that because I'm trying out something new right now. But. There's only one thing that comes to my mind, and that is trouble. So here's what she did. She pulled him into the office and she said, Greg, I've been stealing from you. Now, Greg was a little shocked. So Greg asked her, well, how much? She told him, well, you know, a eh, couple hundred thousand dollars. And she told him that she put it through the poker machines. 
Greg, poor Greg, later found out that that total was $3.7 million. Now, here's why this is really, really bad. Greg had planned on selling his aerosol paint business. And because of this theft, he couldn't sell it. He says that it was devastating. And he said, like a lot of small businesses, we were paying our employees more than we paid ourselves. The intention was that at the end, we would retire and we would be able to sell the business and get our reward. Two and a half years later, Greg is still working in his business. And, well, the thief has gone through bankruptcy court and she's paid back two hundred and thirty five thousand dollars. Now, there are a couple of things that are real interesting about this story, because Greg has said now, let me just quote him. He says, well, let me finish reading the news story. He said that he can't understand why the two uh, um, casinos where she spent the money uh, are allowed to keep the money. This is what Greg has said. He said, I can't see how anyone can morally justify keeping money that they know was stolen. Well, all right, guys, I'm going to put a pin in it right here and open this up for discussion. And then we'll move on because there's more to this story. There's more. So what do you guys think? Greg well, believes you know, the parking oh. lot audit would not have worked for her because she apparently it would have worked in the reverse because she would show up in her 2002 Hyundai to, you know, her boss. But then she'd go to the St. Mary's Rugby Pokey Club and she'd show up in the 2002 Hyundai and she was their number one gambler. What's she doing driving the 2002 Hyundai? Like and. Oh my God, it, it, the story is so crazy. So I went on St. Mary's Rugby's Facebook page. They literally had a legal advice night at the casino. Like I can't make this stuff up. I just like, um, so the reverse parking lot audit, they should have known that the biggest high roller maybe should drive nicer than a 2002 Hyundai. Not that there's anything wrong with that. What do you think, Joe? I think that this story brought up questions in my mind that I never thought about before. That's why I loved it because, you know, I worked in financial services for over 10 years and I did AML OFAC audits and I never thought of the perspective in this article that they need to be watching for criminal activity, just like we do for terrorist activity and that kind of stuff and banks at casinos. Where is this money coming from? Is this legal money that we're using at the casinos? And I, I, you know, I just a complete vulnerability, transparency. I never thought about that. I think that, um, you know, if there's any auditors out there on this LinkedIn live that work in the casino industry, I know I've done some events where there have been, uh, this is something to think about. What is the fiduciary responsibility? What is you know, obviously there's no laws on it now. There's no regulatory responsibilities, but should there be? I love the point that this article brought up. I love it. Now, I think uh, Jacina hit a really good point. It does sound like Ozark. And if you've never seen Ozark, you've got to watch it. Yeah. No money laundering maybe going on, but uh, who knows? Who knows? Maybe there you is. Know. You know. <laughs> but Joe, you bring up an interesting point. It, it does make you think about things you never would have thought about, but to play devil's advocate. Warren Buffett drives a late model Cadillac. So his car is probably about thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 and he's a gazillionaire. Well, maybe not a gazillionaire, but, <laughs> but yeah. So, um, so now if I'm hearing you guys correctly though, you think that the casino should have been doing some sort of due diligence to make sure that it was getting money that uh, was legitimate money. I don't know. I, you know, like that's, that's a really interesting, this is like, like I've said, this is new thoughts for me. I do like, I think I'm a believer after this article and maybe we can post the link to the article for the group uh, in the comments, because I think the auditors on here, you will realize like you're kind of going, wow, maybe there should be some controls like banks, you know, at casinos because that, that, there's that one line in it that says, there is so much fraud money that goes through casinos, right, Kelly? I mean, Kelly, the gambling is the biggest pink flag. That's where the money goes. 
So I don't, it just, it does, it makes you feel like they should be doing more. And this, this to me, where it is, where it becomes a, you know, it, it may not be a legal issue, but it's an ethical issue. And that's what they bring up mm -hmm. in this article. And that's what hits home with me because I'm, you know, I'm a John Vogel fan. I'm a fiduciary. Let's, let's be a steward. Let's own a good moral business. And the point is some of these casinos are just not good moral business. They are profits. Right, they're profit first businesses. They're not. They're not out for for protecting people at all. And and you know, I'm gonna soapbox for a second. You know, it takes me back to Robinhood and how they have compared Robinhood investing, the trading. Uh, if you guys don't know, that's like that fast, you know, kind of day trading app that they've been comparing to gambling. You know, they're getting hammered because they're not training people with the risks of their app and it's kind of like i feel like you know there should be some rules for gambling for casinos to get people trained on what they're doing i don't know so lots of different facets here but well and from the ironic part they gave her the pink diamond and so of course i had to tweet like really they don't even know this is a pink collar crime but you know where i went to because i deal with so many victims is the personal devastation. Like he said, he had her come to his farm, which was he thought he was going to retire to. He trusted this woman and the personal devastation is, and then also he's like, you know, um, the legal system, and this is in Australia, but the legal system has taken so incredibly long that they almost feel like they've been taken advantage of twice. So I go to the victim because it is horrific to like, he had worked his whole life to be able to sell this and to come in. I mean, I personally would have thrown up. I, I know I would have thrown up. So. Oh yeah. yeah. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to bring this up though, is because I knew that we were going to have like the, the moral ethical dilemma that Joe just brought up, but let me just say, Ooh, she was the personal assistant the accounts clerk with access to the bank accounts and had responsibility for paying wages and bills. So now should the casino really pay because he had a lack internal control environment? Yeah. Which is their defense, right? I mean, this is well, number one, they did, they didn't know they have no responsibility to check, you know, that, that kind of, that's their number one, just, you know, if they don't have any knowledge of where the money came from, but you know, I, I think that's, that's a good point. That's a great point. It's yeah. the Margaret Heffernan sticking your head in the sand. It's not, you know, willful blindness is not a defense. Mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. and I'm sorry, is there anyone from the casino here? Because I know I have some casino people, but it's like, you know, I, I worked at a brokerage firm a long, long time ago and um, we would get he was a private investor. And every so often he'd pull up, he'd say wire 250 to Caesars. And the Caesars would send a private jet for him. He could afford it. They knew. I, I just feel that a lot of the casinos do really know. So, but you guys know that's my sub box. I hate gambling. I've seen it just, yeah. Well, and we've got a lot of interesting discussion going on here, especially Sherry. One of her ex-employees had a gambling problem and, and was arrested for stealing money from her sorority. Wow. That is insane. Talk about a pink collar crime, right? <laughs> um, uh, I like Dan's comment. Weak internal control is not a license to steal. Now, right, right. You know, that that's a perfect statement. For that. I mean, yes, he should have had better controls. You know, I mean, this comes back to ethics. Um, but like Hal said, if there was ethics, we wouldn't have a lot of businesses out there if there was. <laughs> if right. That, ethics were the same. So, well, and I think this is an important point. Casinos are required to have SARs. Those are suspicious activity reports. So if it's above, uh, I think it's 3000 or 5000, maybe even 10 now, I don't know, laws change, but uh, you're required to, to file something with uh, the Federal Reserve Bank, I believe it is. I, I've been out of financial services a long time, you guys. Wow. Um, when there's a cash transaction. So uh, if she was bringing in cash, they may have had to file those uh, suspicious activity reports. But but now there is more to the story. There's always more to the story. Right. So 
let's get back to this just a little bit. Oh, oops. Sorry, guys. I didn't mean to put that one up. Let's get us back up here. I like Hal's. I'm watching right now from Hard Rock, Kelly. You're killing me, Hal. Killing me. <laughs> so, um, so now in Australia, apparently there is a law that says that the casinos are supposed to give back about 85% of the money that's put into them. And what the casino was saying is when they audited her records, they only showed um, they only showed that she had lost a couple hundred thousand dollars. Now, the man who owned the company, he put together an Excel spreadsheet and he said he estimated his loss to be about 20 million dollars. Um, and, and so they asked the casinos if they thought that they should be responsible for it. And during a telephone conversation, they said that, you know, they felt like they had no right to 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 monitor someone's activity like that. And they had no obligation to actually pay money back, which, you know, I, I kind of get it from their standpoint. Um, I do think that it is a moral and ethical issue. But I will say the business owner, Eric, that's his name, Eric, he started doing a little um I don't know, virtue signaling as well, because he started saying how the casino, they give money to charitable organizations all the time. And because of that, somehow they should give him money back again. He did not have a sound control environment. His employees stole from him for five, 10 years, maybe even longer. So he is partially to blame for his monetary loss. So while we're all saying here, you know, trust is not a control. Uh, there, there should be some morals and ethics in this. It's, it's a difficult one. I think it's. I think. I'm sorry, is there, is there, is there, me. Um, I think it's interesting that only one of the two casinos that she spent her money in was really participating in this, saying, mm -hmm. "Yes, let we will tell you how much you know she put into our machines." I think. I think just like any business, just like any industry, there are different levels that you can operate on. And I think that that to me is what gets me about this one is yes, he does have some responsibility. I think for me, it is, um, you know, maybe it's not a moral obligation for these casinos, but is it a good business, reputational, uh, a good co a corporate social responsibility? I don't know, could we put another word to it? that that might instead of let's let's take away ethics and morals i love talking about that but let's just say what's good business practice for a casino if if somebody is found to do this and they're using stolen money and, and they go into the financials of these casinos by the way guys and it, it's out of control right i mean they're they're making millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars they're not doing bad um so when does it become just a good practice i mean i i don't know maybe i'm crazy here maybe i'm being a pollyanna but i don't know well it's also like is business is business ethics an oxymoron yeah. i mean you know casinos are built on customer losses it's you know, they don't build these amazing venues because they're losing money mm -hmm. and 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 they know their customers they know who to fly the private jet for they you know and she was their one of their top gamblers you know, they, they did a dossier sort of on her, I'm sure. And uh, it's just, it's, it's sad all around. And that's what I wanted to highlight about this story. Pink collar mm -hmm. crime. It's just, it's really sad. And Robert, you showed a slide at the beginning. She was so nice. She was so kind. And they show a picture of her at a tea. And these are did she grow up at age five saying, I'm going to rip off millions from an employer so I can go play the pokies? No. When I tell you guys what really got me and, and, and Pozo was saying it, too, about the other casino, one casino cooperated. The other one didn't. If you look at this situation, why can't the three of them really put their heads together because there's bound to be insurance that all three of them have that could actually make the gentleman whole. He made a terrible mistake. He surely did because he trusted her too much. But then it also makes you wonder what type of business insurance did he have? Was she bonded? Because surely between the three of them, 
They could actually have cooler heads that would prevail and they could all come together. And I think that's the bigger issue. Why can't we work together as people in society? That to me is the bigger issue here. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Well, and Hal says, what business has an obligation to concern themselves with where the money comes from when a customer spends money? But we have KYC. Yeah. Know your customer. Brokerage firms can't take money that they know comes from a terrorist. Thanks. Um, so she's not a terrorist, but yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I personally, I think, you know, there should be some uh, good practice. Maybe it's not a control. Maybe it's not. There should be some due diligence on uh, looking at their pink diamond people saying, how in the world did this person put $3 million in here. I don't know though. I mean, like when does it, when does it encroach in our privacy too, guys? I mean, that's, that's a huge part of this too. You know, obviously privacy is a big topic in technology. And so there's a lot of topics in this one story. So, and it brings up government at the end, you know, the casinos, the government is um, getting money is making so much off of these casinos. Are they ever going to step in and regulate casinos? Probably not. So, I mean, this has so many facets to it. It's it's a, it's awesome. It's awesome. As many facets as a pink diamond. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but herein lies our question of the day. Would we be talking about the same corporate responsibility if she spent the money at a car dealership or at a clothing store and did not return the money? If she bought a car with it, the feds would go after the car. It would be asset forfeiture. So, so what's right. different of putting a money into a poker machine? It's sitting there. It's just not an asset. I mean, that's a that's a great great point or an analogy, I guess. I don't know. Um, Hal, I'd love to argue with Hal for a second. Casinos do not have fiduciary responsibility, though. Why not? Why not? I mean, you don't have to be regulated. I mean, we implemented fiduciary rules at our financial services company before there was a fiduciary law out there. Why don't they have some sort of fiduciary responsibility? I mean, that can that to me is corporate social responsibility. So that's what I don't get if they want to be respected as a business. I love Tom's thing. What did he say? I missed it. What did Tom say? If the casino is at fault, can I have an employee steal money? If they win, I get 50%. If I, if they lose, I sue the casino. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> you know, hedge Amen. funds. We could start a SPAC, you guys. Let's start a SPAC mm -hmm. with casino losses. See, and, and that that's the conundrum though, because you don't know where to actually draw the line. Because again, really your first, your first fault is this young man, well, this, this gentleman not having controls in his environment at all, like none. That is your first fault. And I think if the casinos want to help him, they can. But I don't I mean, they aren't obligated to. And um, honestly, you never know how much money people have when they walk into the casino. Um, and, and the one that actually did pull her records, I would say that they probably are on the up and up. It's that other one you got to worry about, the one that didn't cooperate. That is probably where she spent a majority of the money because she knew that they wouldn't cooperate if and when she got caught because she knew she was going to get caught at some point. Let's just be real about that. Okay. All right, guys, let's move on to something else. And the something else is going to be a surprise for everyone. Um, <laughs> so before we move on to our next story, our next story is related to the picture you see here. Well, kind of. Oops, I better not say it like that. If you can tell us which one of our co-hosts this is, we will have a prize for you today. Now, I think you guys have a 66% chance of getting it right at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Robert, that looks just like you. What are you talking about? <laughs> I think you have a 66% <laughs> chance of getting it right. And here's what we're going to do, though. As you drop into the chat who you think it is, we're not going to tell you just yet because we have another one coming up later and we're going to ask you to guess who that person is, too. So the first person that can get it right. <laughs> Hal, I think you got it right. Let's see. Hal said it was Robert. <laughs> I missed who said it. Who got I missed the first person. Hold on. 
Oh, I've got it. I, I see who the first person is. Okay. So <clears throat> we have a winner. And while we're here, Joe, tell everyone about the book club. Oh, the book club is what I do about once a month. I give a CPE uh, after I read a book and you don't have to. I just tell you about the book. Yesterday, we did Kelly's book. If you missed it, it was a lot of fun. Benita was there. A couple of people on were probably there. Uh, we had a lot of fun and you can still watch it on demand if you would like. Uh, just visit my website or go to cpebookclub.com. Next month, we're doing, um, I'm doing Adam Grant's book, Think Again. And sadly, Adam Grant is not coming like Kelly came yesterday. Uh, but I'm going to tell you all about the book. So I'm excited about that. It's, it's a great book. It's June 24th. And it's a great book. Think Again. Excellent book. All right. Kelly, what do you have going on? What do I have going on? Oh, I don't know. I'm doing um, an IMA chapter next week in Colorado. So... Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? Someone sent me an email that Joe and I had such good rapport. And I just took that as such an honor because honestly, we had so much fun. As always, we always have so much fun. It was. Well, yes. As you can see, Benita said that it was a lot Ooh. of fun. I actually talked to Benita yesterday and she was telling me how much fun it was in the book club. I hated to have missed that one. And so for me, the Ask Better Questions boot camp is in full swing. We have another cohort starting on May the 24th or 25th, whatever that Monday is. So if you want to sign up, go to that auditguy.com backslash boot camp. My books are always for sale on Amazon. Uh, Ask Better Questions, Get Better Answers, Perform Better Audits, the best auditing book out there about asking questions, probably because it's the only one out there about asking questions. <laughs> and it is, like I said earlier, Internal Audit Awareness Month. If you love audit like Joe, go get your shirt. That auditguy.com backslash apparel will get you there. And while we are here, you guys take a look at this picture. Now, I want you to look at the people on the, uh, wait a minute, Let wait, left, right, left hand side of the screen. One of those two on the left is one of our co-hosts. If you can guess which one <laughs> is, one of, see, I made this one a little harder, right? So you got to tell me which one. The last two, the one standing up or the one sitting down, which one is our co-host and which one it is, the one standing up or the one sitting down? No, that's both sitting down. I'm sorry, say again? It's both sitting down. They're both sitting down? And if that isn't a clue, guys. <laughs> Look from the, the bottom of the picture, the second one on the left, sitting down. Who is that? Oh, thank you, Joe. Or Robert. <laughs> Robert. Robert left, second one in, sitting down. Or Kelly. Th th thank you, Joe. I just confused everybody when I said it that time. So um, that's why they don't let me talk a whole lot, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. Is that Robert behind the curtain? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Again, you have a 66% chance. Hey, have we decided we had we'll talk about that later. We hadn't decided what we're going to give away this week. Uh yeah, Hal says is it me behind the curtain? It might be Hal. Okay. So <laughs> so now, now that we've gotten our prizes uh sorted out, what we'll do is we'll we'll send a message through LinkedIn announcing the winners probably in the same thread with the uh video from this week. So now let's move on to our next story. Oh, Joe, you missed last week. So last week, after about 30 or 45 minutes, we were going to shut it down. And everybody said, you need to make it a one hour show. Well, I, I noticed it went on. I rewatched it. I was like, wow, they went on for a long time without me. Jeez, they don't even need me. <laughs> Jeez, thanks. We need you. Here, here's what happened. Here's what happened. They felt sorry for Kelly having to be left alone with me. <laughs> And they figured they would contribute more. So that, that's what happened. So that, <laughs> but Hal, says, you are killing me, Hal. Oh my God. You know what? I bet my husband the other night about something that I was so passionate about. And he looked at me, he's like, You're betting me. And I was like, Oh yeah, because I don't bet. <laughs> and I can't wait for his dude weekend those for me to be right. Like literally, he's like. That's strong for you to bet. And I'm it's about a mean, nasty friend. Oh, hell, hell wants to place a bet a bet at the casino on who it is. 
Emily. Hi, Emily. Are we really not going to tell them which is which right now? You're going to like make it all suspenseful? Uh, well, I was. Do you really want to tell them? Oh, well, I just was wondering. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was going to make it suspenseful because I want people to go back to the post and, and, okay. all right. and read the post. But I mean, you know, if, if I'm outvoted here, what do you want to do, uh, um, uh, Kelly? Oh, my brain. You know what's so funny is there's one picture where it's black and white and the other one is color. Now, as an investigator, you could go, hmm, Kelly's older, so it's probably black and white. Ooh. Look at you and your fraud. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know what? Okay, you got me now. Let's let's go back and tell who's who. Let's get Emily off the screen for a little bit here and uh, let me. So this one is, who is it? And she's wearing pink. It's Joe. <laughs> so this one is Joe. That's Joe. Those hey. are my first pair of tap shoes right there. Now, isn't it interesting? Yvonne just met Hal and she has already discovered what we all know. <laughs> all right. So that means that this person right here, well, wait a minute, right here. No, that's in, the wait, no, This one. Yeah, that's her. That's oh, this one. Yeah. Sorry. Oops. You yeah. can't tell? I this person. Well, I could have picked Kelly out of that picture. I guess I've seen a lot of dance photos, but I was like, that's so <laughs> Kelly. But it's funny. I mean, honestly, like, think of this in an investigation. This is black and white, and Joe's was color. And you guys, I'm a lot older than Joe. You are so, not a lot older than me. Yeah, I am. So well, it's kind of funny, though, to think of, like, yeah. evidence that you have how can it be telling you something sorry mm -hmm. i just listened to a really good podcast this morning that was kind of fascinating along that well line. you guys understand this is why kelly is so good at what she does though yeah. i mean I, honestly that didn't cross my mind oh, mine either this but is I'm why old. kelly this, <laughs> <laughs> this is why kelly is so good at what she does so now here's our next story oh boy a ballet school rehired an embezzler and then one and a half million dollars vanished. Okay, so listen, this one is really cool. Well, maybe not cool, but okay, the nerd in me is coming out. So in the summer of 2017, when one of the country's premier ballet schools was looking to hire a comptroller, they hired Sophia Kim. But Miss Kim had a gambling habit and had recently spent almost two years in prison for embezzling almost $800,000 from a nonprofit affiliated with the dance school. So why was anyone surprised when, well, she stole again, right? So here's what they did. They put her in charge of the books and they gave her access to the BB&T bank account and debit card. And she had access to all the school's accounts. So let's talk about the, the original conviction first. Let me just tell you guys about that. The original conviction was uh, between 2001 and 2005 while working for a foundation. She drove to Atlantic City to play blackjack with its money. And that's according to federal prosecutors in Virginia. Um, she was charged with false tax, filing a false tax return and tax evasion. The government said that the investigation began because of the discrepancies between the amount of money flowing through her personal bank account and the amount that she reported on her income taxes. Now, her lawyers, check out what her lawyers said, you guys. Now, this, this is where it gets really funny. Hal is going to have a lot of stuff to say about this. Her lawyers said that her efforts were not designed to benefit her personally, but rather they argued that Miss Kim was a devoted church member and a divorced mother of three and was gambling uh, and day trading in an effort to offset poor investments made by the foundation. So she, I'm <clears throat> I was trying to get through that one without laughing, you guys. So get this now. She stole money and went to the casino to offset some of the losses that the foundation had. So and, and here's a quote that her lawyer said during the trial, quote, she thought she'd have a chance to raise additional revenue. Kevin Brim, her lawyer said during trial, but the jury found her guilty and she was sentenced to two years in prison back in 2013. 
Okay, so now let's talk about today. Today, one of the former executive directors said, I wondered myself why they would hire her back. <laughs> Good call, my friend. Um, so in this case, they said that she siphoned money from the accounts uh, in 2018. The discrepancies were discovered when uh, somebody was looking into the school accounts. They hired somebody else, a, an additional worker, right? Segregation of duties. Uh, <laughs> she was added to the accounts, and then that's when the discrepancies were found. And an outside accounting firm did an analysis and later found that she had misappropriated approximately. Now, here's where it gets kind of funny, too, because they said approximately. But listen to this number. One million five hundred one thousand two hundred eighty three dollars and thirteen cent from the BB&T account and a SunTrust bank account through unauthorized checks, debit card and credit card transactions. Uh, so so after they, they apprehended her, she was released on November 20th, promising to stay away from gambling establishments. But she went right back to the casino. <sighs> I don't like to victim shame like I, I do not like to victim shame, but I might do it here. <laughs> well, we kind of already did that because Robert did that to the last guy. <laughs> he totally picked up the guy for not having control. So you can do it, Kelly. You can do it. Well, and Dan says lawyers. Yeah. Oh, man. Lawyers. And Emily, hashtag terrible excuse. Oh, my gosh. You're doing the fraud hashtags. Love it. <laughs> I tell you what. Heather said, how did a ballet school have that much money? Heather, they have a $4 million budget. Yeah, ask my mom how much ballet cost for 18 years. Thomas said that too. You clearly, you don't have a daughter in dance. But in all honesty, like these are huge ballet companies, like like big time. This is not like your local dance studio. This is this is big time. I guess it's almost like cheerleading too. You know, that's, that's big business and the pageants. So yeah, they, they had a lot of money. And see, Yvonne is our... HR expert, she said, rehired an embezzler. That is crazy. No reference checks. Ah, thank you, Yvonne. Always great to have an HR person with us here. Even one, right? Like, what are the rules on that, Kelly? Because I mean, she served. You said two years on the first case, right, Robert? So, yeah, like they should have been able to see that. I know, like you know, like Kelly said, a lot of them don't go to trial, so a lot of times you are rehiring them without knowing. But in this instance, I mean, there are ways they should have known, right, Kelly? I mean. Right. Well, then the other thing that um, I'm looking here quickly is she was charged with like, you know, that failing to pay taxes. So they might have looked and said failure to pay taxes and asked her. I mean, I think it's doubtful, but they could have and she could have just said, oh, it was just an IRS issue and they didn't look any farther. Because again, we don't even have any more embezzlement as a charge. It's, and this is why white collar crime, pink collar crime statistics are so messy. They don't charge thieving, they charge failure to pay taxes on the stolen money. Yep. That's great, great to know. Thanks, Kelly. Now I tell you what, Jacina needs to come back every week. I'm wondering why Rev Sun Moon started a ballet company. Hmm. It says, it says that, wait, because he had, um, he called it the heavenly art of dance and he wanted it to be a creative outlet for his daughter-in-law, a former member of the Washington Ballet. And it's fairly easy to commit fraud through things like that, right? When you, when you splash on the news from local towns, it's always the cheerleading camp or the local booster club or the football team or the ballet club. And I think that's what she was getting at. And I get it. As soon as I saw it, I was like, yeah, this is why this is why we need you here every week. Well, I mean, this is why Kelly wrote a book on this topic and has chapters on the specific organizations that get hit the most. Like this is why we ha we talked yesterday about dental offices and, you know, maybe we need to add ballet companies to Kelly's next book. book <laughs> but I mean, like there are specific like Robert said, there's specific ones that you go, oh, you know, it's kind of like your kid's PTA or your, you know, you just don't think it's going to happen. And it seems to be where it happens the most. Well, check out what Emily said. She's been asked not to vet applicants with external searches, i.e. LinkedIn, Google, et cetera, in the past. Why would, yeah, why would you not want to know that type so of information? This, 
I've done a ton of background checks. You have to be consistent. So you can't go out and do that Google search on say the janitor and not on the CFO. And True. there's a real big problem. Then also you might find something on Facebook and I used to use this example, my apologies to the Wiccans out there, that if you find that someone's a Wiccan and you don't hire them, you know, or you find out that say someone supports um, breast cancer or type one diabetes and you don't hire them, well, they're a protected class. So you have to, this is, I mean, oh my gosh. Okay, HR, Yvonne, this is such an area fraught with problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and Dan brings up a really good question. Does hiring a known felon invalidate employee embezzlement insurance? Well, well, I don't, is it called employee embezzlement insurance? No, I'm just kidding, Dan. <laughs> but I get your point though. <laughs> From my book, my little book here, that um, the thousand and one embezzlers, you know, they do background checks. Yeah. So, you know, they probably didn't do, um, they probably didn't have a policy because if they did, they would have said, we won't bond her. Yep. See, Carl is saying what I was saying, you know, those, those types of uh, environments, it's really easy. You always see the soccer mom getting arrested for stealing a million dollars from, you know, the kid's soccer uh, account. And, and yeah. Well, and the other thing is, as children... If, if you have kids, do you want to explain to your kids? And I, I think I say this in my book, you can't go to that soccer tournament in Las Vegas, or you can't go to that dance competition in Dallas, because you know what, that nice lady or man stole all our money. And to tell that to a kid that's in like, it's devastating again, victim devastation. Now let's do the update to this story because just last week, she actually pleaded guilty to fraud in the U.S. District Court in Washington. Um, and they what they are saying is over the nine months period, over a nine month period of time in 2018, they say that she wrote two checks to herself, used the bank card 120 times and then withdrew cash and then paid off losses at the MGM Grand Casino. Now, the school discovered it and then they called the FBI and she was arrested at the casino November 2019. So in, in the filings, they're talking about the activity from 2018. So I'm wondering what happened during 2019 from January to November, because she was actually caught in the casino November of 2019. The fraud charges carry a statutory penal penalty of up to 30 years in prison and a fine of up to $3 million. She's set to be sentenced in September. I was really surprised it was so it was so much in this one. Is the dollar is the what is the year sentence related to? That was one of my questions I wanted to ask Kelly. Is the is it dollar for sentencing guidelines and it's part of it it's part of the sentencing guidelines is the loss. So um you get it's a point system. So gotcha. it yeah, there's a little discretion there. And if she pays money back, but we know hashtag don't steal to save, um, you know, it, it'll be interesting. In September, we will revisit this. And maybe if anyone is in D.C. that um, like they could go and see her. <laughs> <laughs> Do a jail side interview, right? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> that's terrible. Interesting. But, but yeah. yeah, like Yvonne said, no reference checks. She should have stolen more. <laughs> Steal like a man. <laughs> yeah, we talked about that yesterday. Oh, goodness. Uh, Ever well, hear of background also, investigation? She needs a job to pay the fine. Maybe the casino will hire her. Let's go back to the story that I use a lot, Bernice Geiger, who stole the equivalent of $17 million from her dad's own bank. When she got out of prison, she consulted in the 60s for the precursor to the FDIC. So maybe the casino should hire her. And someone else also said earlier about, you know, she can come out and write a book about it and go on the speaker circuit. That's what I, I saw that. I was like, she could be on the speaker circuit. I love it. Oh, I yeah. missed that one. Now, now, Emily is saying, what, no SARS for her at the casino? You know, honestly, this woman was, was a, well, 
it, it, are you a pro if you got caught twice? She <laughs> she had a lot of practice. That's what I want to say. She had a lot of practice. So she probably knew the dollar threshold that would trigger a suspicious activity report. And she probably stayed below it. Um, you know, so many questions here, though. You knew she was an embezzler. So you hired her a second time after she stole from one of your sister organizations. And when you hired her the second time, you didn't put in any segregation of duty. She had access to everything, the keys to the kingdom, as they say. So now I think you as an organization are pretty culpable in this. Like I, I have no sympathy or empathy for them at all, like none. But again, I total victim shaming. It's it's the participants of the academy that get hurt. Right. So it the trickle down, not trickle down economics, trickle down fraud. That could be a new term, trickle down fraud. Well, and I guess where I'm going with it, too, is if you look in the U.S., we have a little something called Sarbanes-Oxley, right? If something happens bad at an organization, the executives running that organization, they have to pay. So why wouldn't that same thing apply in this situation? You negligently hired a known criminal who stole from you, put her in the same position of authority that she was in the previous time she stole from you and expected a different outcome. It'd be interesting to see because I'm sure that that's what her lawyer will say, right? Oh, I'm sure that's what he's going to say. Now, I again, I, I think the directors in that organization should be held accountable for this as well, because I think that is just gross negligence. And as you said, Kelly, and as you said, Joe, the kids who just want to dance, they're the ones who suffer the most because of this. Um, now, obviously, this dance troupe did not have an internal auditing function or anything like that, but surely they had an external audit firm that did some sort of year in work when they were putting together the financial statements for them. Well, and you know, this makes me think we should have pulled up the form 990. Oh, we should have. Yeah. I think though, on that note, you know, I kind of had that initial gut reaction of like, how come no one noticed this? Like I always have that. I have two things that I like to say, like who else knew? And like, how did no one else know, right? Like there, there's two different frauds or, uh, you know, things that happen. There's like two different cases. Um, and this one though, she seemed to have, I mean, she was the only one looking. So as long as everybody was getting paid, there was nothing, you know, there was no, there was nothing anybody would have seen. I don't think I, like you said, it's all about the control she had and the power that she had. But I guess where I was going with that is we all don't realize how in some of these, especially like we've talked about, um, like organizations, they have no finance knowledge. They won't touch it with a 10 foot pole. So like, it, you know, I, I have the, this moment of somebody should have been like, we're, we don't have enough money, but they don't even, they, they don't want, they don't want to know. They don't want to see it. They don't want involvement. Like they are not like us at all. I, I mean, so, I, you know, and this goes with like HOA boards too, right? They pick a treasurer and the treasurer is the only one that tends to look at the money, right? Because nobody else wants to do it. And you find that one sucker that's a CPA in your neighborhood to be on the HOA board. But, you know, that's, uh, anyway, that's. Well, just, and, and Pozo, I hope you don't mind us calling you Pozo. It's just so much easier. But I, there's um, an accounting professor in upstate New York and I'm totally blanking on her name. No money, no mission. So the profits, nonprofits, no money, no mission. Mm -hmm. So you can have the greatest mission in the world, but if the money walks out the door, you can't fulfill it. Oh, by the way, guys, Pozo is now officially the Oprah of accounting. That is her new title. I, she saw, is. That. I saw that on her LinkedIn, I think. Her that is correct. Yep. So she is the Oprah of accounting. So now... I think I have to refer to her as your highness. <laughs> I think we should call her Oprah. <sighs> yeah, we'll just call you Oprah. So Hal says when someone starts stealing, something about them changes that could be seen in hindsight. But she was a professional criminal and so nothing changed. Yeah. Did you, I mean, do you see her picture? Robert put her picture back up. I just, oh, yeah. I just looked like 
I don't know. I, I just, yeah. She looked like a professional criminal to me. Yeah, she uh -huh. doesn't have a care in the world. Yeah. I mean, this is like, um, like no conscience kind of person to me. I don't know why. I just, it's amazing what a picture, picture's worth a thousand words, right? I don't know. All right, so let's get into this a little bit more because I did a little bit more digging and uh, I didn't know if we were going to have time, but we have time. She actually started uh, working in the church in South Korea. And she had her eyes set on leaving South Korea and coming to the U.S. And so she married someone and that is how she got to the U.S. Now, the, th the stuff that I read about her background and how she operated in the church in South Korea and then how she operated once she got to the U.S., I think, and again, just my opinion, my opinion alone, I think that she is a con artist. I think that she is a career criminal and a professional con artist who planned a lot of the things that she did from the beginning, from the time that she was a kid in South Korea, from the time that she got involved with the church to even marrying the person that she married to get U.S. citizenship, to get her out of South Korea, to still dealing with the church because churches are some of the easiest organizations to steal from because of the uh, philanthropic spirit within them. But when you read her background, it looks like someone who planned and plotted her entire life from the time she was a kid. So this is one of Kelly's like least favorite people because Kelly wants to wake up every day thinking that nobody plans to commit a fraud when they're five. But I think we may have found the bad apple, right? And we know there's bad, there's bad apples out there in the bunch. Good news is that there aren't as many, but this is, I agree. I think it's probably one of them. Yeah, and Mark says religious organizations assume that she was mm -hmm. repentant and all and was all better. Yep. Mm -hmm. But but I can guarantee, well, no, I'm not gonna say guarantee. I'm willing to bet that if you go back to South Korea. There's some money missing from the church coffers down there in South Korea as well. So th th there was a lot to this woman's background that was just really interesting and fascinating. Someone should do a story on her. She would probably be my second favorite villain because we all know who my first favorite villain is, right? Elizabeth Holmes. Yes, my first favorite villain. Why, um, Why are they all female, Robert? Is there something you're trying to... <laughs> No, no, has nothing to do with gender. But I will say, Elizabeth Holmes, she is my favorite, honestly, because when you look at this woman, you could see it from the beginning. It didn't take a genius to know that this woman was shady, but everybody ignored it. Like the first time I saw her, I was like, are we seriously trusting this person? Like the red flags, the lack of eye contact, the, the, the way she mimicked Steve Jobs to the letter. The fear that he instilled in her employees, it was just so obvious. So I just started the new Madoff book. It, I believe it's, I can't run up and get it because you guys would see that I'm still in my running shorts. If I got up, you're going to see that. Now, um, it, I think it's called Madoff Talks and yeah. it's by, um, I just started it and it's, it's fascinating, but you know what else? And I think we're going to have to like discuss this. Maybe this will be a book club too, Joe. Mm -hmm. Is um, there is a new book out talking about Frank Abagnale? Catch me if you can. That he's a con. Like the, all of his story is all made up. And I saw that, and I am like, oh my god. So that's um, yeah. Ordering that book too, because if Frank Abagnale is a con, it, 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 the whole thing has been a con. I am going to be like jumping for joy. That's crazy. I want to tell me, you'll have to tell us what it is, Kelly, because I haven't seen that either. For sure. Okay. Yeah. So there are a couple of things. Hal is hilarious. Elizabeth Holmes never blinks. Hal, you noticed that too, right? Like, seriously, she just, if you were to paint a picture of the ultimate criminal, she would be it from the mannerisms to everything. But so let's 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 talk about Frank Abagnale for just one moment so that because not everyone knows who he is. So Frank Abagnale was a uh, uh, well, I, well, I guess for now we can still say he was one of the most famous career criminals and, and he did a lot of check fraud and they made a movie after him. The movie Catch Me If You Can is about his story. And this was back in the day when people wrote checks and he just did a lot of things to actually defraud a lot of people out of a lot of money. So what Kelly is saying now is that he may not have been 
a Czech thief, that his story about being a Czech thief that he sold to everyone. And now he's making millions of dollars now that he's gotten out of jail because the FBI has actually hired him to work for them. That story may be fraudulent. Is that so what you're saying? Yeah, the book is called The Greatest Hoax on Earth, Catching Truth While We Can. I'll put the um, link in the comments later, just because I'm on two different screens. But um, I've seen Frank speak, and I'm fascinated by this. He gets paid a ton of money for his presentations. And I've actually heard they're not very good. My parents actually saw him speak. And so doesn't that make you wonder... Like, you know, is the, um, you know, is it because you're not genuinely, you didn't genuinely do those things that you can't genuinely speak about it well? I don't know. That's just an, I, that's crazy. And what a con to con about being a con artist. Wow. That would be fascinating. Well, Keely says she saw Frank speak and uh, she believes him. Okay. All right. Interesting. Okay, you got to get the book, Keely. I know. Let us know. We're going to have to do a book club on this one. Um, so yeah. my alarm went off because at 1.55, Mountain Time, I have to go get my son from the fourth grade. So I love you guys, all of you, and I'm going to have to drop. You are more welcome, more than welcome to stay with Kelly and Robert. But yeah, it was fun. See you it was time. a lot of fun. Um, we are going to end it in just a minute. So Joe. Bye. We'll see you later. See you guys. Have a good weekend. You too. We will see you next week. Well, we'll see you before next week. Um, so yeah, Hal says Abignell has been telling a lie about his fraud. <laughs> Damn, can't trust criminals these days. <laughs> you know, the oh. RP pays him a lot of money. A lot of money. And it's yeah. gonna be big egg on face if yeah. it turns out to be true. Well, and it really does make you wonder how true is it um, and, and how was he able to con everyone into thinking he was a con? And and then didn't he spend time in jail as well? I think he did. But you know what? I'm pretty sure his son is an FBI agent. Ooh. Yeah, man. it's going to be I, I got I, I'm ordering the book as soon as we get off. I'm ordering it. I meant to order it last night. But um yeah, so uh, it's going to be interesting to follow this story because I know a lot of people who have seen him. I know people who know him. And if this is a con, it's it's going to be crazy. All right, guys. So let's talk about some of the lessons that we've learned from today. So first, we had three point seven million stolen from a small business because of, well, the same old stuff lack of segregation of duties and lack of controls. Uh, we had a gentleman who is now trying to hold the casinos culpable for his lack of controls. Will that work? I don't know. We also had a young lady who has stolen quite a bit of money from a ballet troupe of all things, a ballet troupe. And as Shomi says, the plot thickens. <laughs> The plot thickens. So today was pretty interesting. Hal says truth is stranger than fiction. So you guys, if you had a good time, we will be here next Friday. Same time, same channel. Just go to my LinkedIn profile. I usually send out a notice a few days beforehand. If you click that remind me, then you'll be reminded whenever I go live. Just look at the top of my profile and You'll see it replaces my picture with a picture that looks much better than me. It's a picture of all of us here doing the Friday Fraudsters. And on that note, I'm going to take us out. Um, I don't think I'm going to take us out with Mufasa today. I'm going to take us out the way that we came in and we'll read some comments while we're on our way out. So let me know which song you like best, the, the old intro song or our new song that we have for this week. Because I just wanted to try something new. The new intro song from this week is actually an old hip hop song I used to listen to when I was a kid. So let me know which one you like best and we'll see you next week.